I saw a tweet, or I think it was a post or something, someone sent me it, of a guy that during this quarantine, he turns on the broadcast of the Mass, and then he takes the baby outside so that his Mass experience can be realistic, like it is on Sunday, he has to say, assist at Mass outside. Parents at Mass are oftentimes distracted. They have babies crying, they've got babies fighting, um, they've got all sorts of stuff to deal with, and sometimes people will say after all the children are growing up that they found uh, an opportunity of peace to be able to assist at Mass without distractions. There's different kinds of distractions. Some are voluntary, some are involuntary. But the fact is that many of us have many distractions and they come at the worst times. We don't want to be distracted in our prayers and yet oftentimes we are distracted. It's part of the reason for the bell. We are entering an important part of the Mass and the bell rings so that we will not be distracted. Why are we distracted? Well, there are many reasons, but a big reason is because we give free reign to our imagination. Now, there's a time when our imaginations can roam freely, when we are dreaming. Our imaginations can do whatever they want. But otherwise, our imagination should be serving us. Sometimes our imagination helps us get knowledge that otherwise we wouldn't have. It can piece together a picture of something that we haven't seen so that we can get an idea of more or less what it would look like. For example, if I were to tell you the Bota for Mario, the Bota for Mario, yeah, the Bota for Mario, I'm having difficulty even pronouncing the word, so I'm sure that many people who are watching this right now have no idea what a Bota for Mario is. Those of you who have been to Santiago de Compostela, St. James's Basilica in Compostela, probably know what it is. But those who have not been there at the right time, when they're actually using this thing, have no idea what it is. However, I can describe it to you. It's a giant, giant thurible. Now you all know what a thurible is. We just used one at the benediction to put the incense in. And we offer the incense to God in this thurible. The Bota Femerio is basically a giant, giant thurible. And there are priests that their only job is to swing this giant thurible. And they will come to the Basilica of Santiago at certain times of the day, on certain days of the week, and there will be, I believe, five or six of these guys. And they will uh, begin the swinging of this thing. And some could call it a sport, some could call it a devotion, some could call it a distraction. However, they really get into it, pulling on these huge ropes back and forth among them, saying heave or whatever they say to, to get in synchronization with this thing. And eventually this giant thurible starts swinging the full length of the basilica, down one aisle, back to the center, down the other aisle, back to the center. And this thing picks up some speed and it becomes a massive projectile. So using your imagination, you have now kind of developed what this thing is. And you could take it a step further. They say that when something tragic is going to happen in society, the Bolt of Femerio breaks loose and disaster happens. And it's broken loose, I believe twice, in history and gone flying through the basilica and landing and causing damage. But each time it breaks, something tragic happens in history. 
I believe one of them was when King Henry VIII uh, divorced his first wife or something like when she was going to get married to him. She went there first to pray at Santiago de Compostela and that day the boat of Maria broke. So that was one occasion. But at any rate, our imagination, that's where I'm getting at with this. Our imagination can also help us to pray. For example, during the rosary you can picture the coronation of our Blessed Mother. All we can do is picture it because none of us have been there. And yet we can use our imagination to create the scenario of Our Lady's coronation. And then we can meditate on that decade of the rosary. So the imagination is very powerful if we use it well. If we don't use it well or if we leave it alone, it's very much like, like a tiger in your living room. A raged tiger in your living room. Make a little bit of a mess. Now the best way to calm our imagination is just not to give it images to look at in the first place. And the way to do that is by doing what they call the custody of the eyes. Custody of the eyes is a practice where you refrain from looking at things, either good things or bad things, so that you can keep a certain purity of heart. Now, some things go without saying that you should not look at them and by looking at them you defile your soul and you fall to sins of impurity. Yes, that is one level of practicing this custody of the eyes. We should not look at anything that will defile our impurity. However, you can take this custody of the eyes another level and train your eyes so that they don't wander here and there so that we can keep our imaginations in check and not fill them up too much so that we are not distracted in prayers. And we, talk, we, we see saints who really took this custody of the eyes, this practice of this virtue, to the next level. For example, they will say that um, rather than looking at a, at a beautiful lady's body, you should look at her face. But the saints would take it a step further and they would actually look a little bit above the person's face so that they're not even looking at the person's face. There's a story of a monk that they used to tell us in the monastery. And the monk was uh, serving dinner to the other monks. And the superior of that monastery asked him, could he go and bring him a banana? And the monk went to the kitchen and came back and said, I don't find any bananas. And the superior said, go back to the kitchen and just look up. And the monk went back to the kitchen and he looked up and there hanging from the rafter right in front of him was a huge bunch of bananas. He was keeping the custody, custody of the eyes maybe a little too much so that he didn't even see what was immediately above his head. Dom Hubert Van Zeller talks about an incident where he had just finished remodeling his chapel in his monastery and a friend came and he wanted to show his friend the remodeling that he did in his chapel. He was pretty happy with how he had made the remodeling. It turned out quite beautiful. And he wanted to show his friend. And so he asked his friend, do you want to go see the chapel? The, the friend, the other monk, came out of the chapel after 20 minutes. Dom Hubert said, well, what did you think? And his monk friend said, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to look. I was so engrossed praying to our Lord that I only looked at the tabernacle. So he went back in and he looked at the church and then he came back and he said, oh, it's a beautiful, it's very beautiful what you've done. Our Lord himself practiced this custody of the eyes. We can see it right before he goes into the Beatitudes on the Sermon on the Mount. Luke chapter 6 begins saying, and he lifting up his eyes on his disciples. In other words, his disciples are right in front of him, but he has to look up from the ground that he was looking at 
at his disciples before he began to speak. So why am I talking about custody of the eyes? Well, because we have gotten to the consecration. And at that moment, the priest bows down, he rests his arms on the altar, and the host is in his hands, and he says the words of consecration. And then without taking his eyes off the host, he genuflects, gets up, and then he raises the host on high. And the rubrics in the Missal specifically say to show the host to the people. He's raising it way above his head to show the host to the people. In other words, our Lord is presenting himself, now consecrated in the host, to our eyes. For us to be able to gaze on our Lord at that moment, we should have pure eyes. Blessed are the eyes that see the things that you see. We should not consider this practice of custody of the eyes as something negative, something that we are not supposed to do. Oh, I'm not allowed to look at this. I'm not allowed to look at that. We should look at the practice of the custody of the eyes with a positive motive. In other words, we have a glass of soda and we want to empty the glass of soda so that we can fill the glass with wine. All these things that we look at when we are not practicing custody of the eyes, they are all things that are of this world, here and now. They are not ours. We are passing through. We are on a journey. We are not stopping here. Not stopping to smell the roses, to continue on because we are on a journey. We are going somewhere. And we need to get to the destination. We are refraining from enjoying the moment so that we can look forward to the destination. In other words, we practice custody of the eyes to remove the things that distract us so that we can find the things we hope for. To remove the things that distract us so that we can find the things we hope for. There is a tendency in Catholic culture to not presume that we will make it to heaven. And sometimes that translates into a fear. Maybe I'll make it to heaven. Maybe I'll make it to purgatory. I'll be lucky if I get into purgatory. Only a few are saved. It's presumption to think that I will be saved. Now, while these thoughts are common, especially among traditional Catholics, it's not necessarily the correct approach. Fear of hell is a good thing if it helps us to avoid sin. However, at its best, it is imperfect. Fear of the Lord, the gift of the Holy Ghost, is a good thing it helps us to avoid sin, but not because we are afraid of punishment, but rather because we fear offending our loving Father. And the difference between these two fears is essentially the difference between a perfect and an imperfect act of contrition. The perfect act of contrition is when you have fear of the Lord. I fear that I have offended my Father. The, perf the imperfect act of contrition is that fear of hell. I'm afraid that I'm going to be punished after this life. And rather than fear, we should have hope. Now hope is one of the three theological virtues. Faith, hope, and charity. And like faith and charity, its object is God. It deals directly with God. With faith we believe in God, 
with charity we love someone for the love of God, or rather I should say we love God, and with hope we hope to be with God. Faith and charity are usually a major part of our lives. Charity is the first virtue that anybody who wants to practice a virtue usually starts practicing. Okay, I'm going to be nice to people. Faith plays a ma major part in our life. Every time we pray, every time we go to Mass, every time we do anything for our religion, it is kind of fired by this faith, this virtue of faith that we believe in God. But we need to practice hope more. We need to practice hope as much as we are practicing faith and as much as we are practicing charity. We need to have that hope that we will be with God in heaven. Our spiritual lives should not be run by fear, especially a fear of hell. Rather, our spiritual lives should be motivated by hope, the desire to be with God in heaven. We should not be pharisaical and think that it is presumption to use the phrase, when I get to heaven. It is presumption to say when I get to heaven when you are living a life that in no way is going to get you to heaven. So if you're living a life of sin and apostasy and you say when I get to heaven, yes, that is presumption. But if you're living a life of virtue and trying to live the faith and trying to practice virtue and trying to avoid sin and going to confession and going to mass, then when you say, when I get to heaven, it's not presumption, it's actually hope. It's very much like after a long day at work, you get in the car and you're driving home and you say with the natural virtue of hope, I can't wait to get home. So also, if we are pointing in the right direction towards heaven and we are trying our best to get to heaven, it is an act of supernatural hope to say, I can't wait to get to my heavenly home. But let's get back to the moment. The priest is elevating the host at the consecration. And the priest is raising the host for us to look at, to behold, and adore. Just as Simeon in Luke chapter 2 gazed upon the divine child and was filled with hope, now you may dismiss your servant in peace, because my eyes have seen thy salvation. Just as Zacchaeus saw Christ from the sycamore tree, this day salvation has come to this home, Luke chapter 19. Just like St. Thomas saw the wounds in Christ's hands and sighed and exclaimed, My Lord and my God, this is the moment of the Mass that gives us hope. So that we can live our daily lives trying to practice this virtue of hope, as best we can each day, hoping to get to heaven. Each time we pray those evening prayers, maybe make an act of hope, hoping that we will get to heaven one day. And then when we come to Mass and when the priest raises the host, we can look at the host and that is the moment when we express that hope. As our Lord said, if I be raised up, I will draw all things to myself. When Christ was raised on the cross, he drew all things to himself because he opened the gates of heaven. He offered himself to the Father. When, when the host is raised on high, Christ offers himself to the Father and draws all men to himself. This is when our hope makes sense. This is the moment that Christ offers himself for our sins. He gives purpose to our hope so that we hope not of our own merits that we will be saved, but that Christ is offering himself to the Father and that gives us hope. If I be lifted up, 
I will draw all men to myself.